Uh, bom dia, pessoal, bom dia a todos. Estamos iniciando aí mais uma sessão da, da quinta edição do Workshop de Inovação em Engenharia Biomédica. Né? Hoje vamos começar o segundo dia do evento com uh, recebendo o Dr. Vincent uh, Ribas uh, Ripple, uh, que nos dará uma aula sobre métodos de aplicações envolvendo inteligência artificial na medicina e na engenharia biomédica em geral. Né? Então, vou passar aqui para o inglês e para receber o Dr. Vincent. Uh, Dr. Ribas, é um grande prazer e honra ter você aqui conosco hoje. Uh, we we are very very looking forward for your talk and your lecture. Um, so let me just introduce you. Dr. Vincent is the scientific coordinator of digital health department at Eurocat, the technology center of uh, Catalonia in Spain. Uh, co-chair of the FUT Open Research and Innovation Action from the Horizon 2020 program. <coughs> Also, professor, at uh, if if you understood correctly, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, I, I think you have teaching activities at the uh, Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya, uh, UPC, right? Yeah. Yes. And uh, he has a he has a doctorate in artificial intelligence and, and several master's degrees: mathematical engineering, telecom telecommunication engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, extensive experience with AI applied to healthcare, and also experience as an entrepreneur and AI consultant. So. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's really a pleasure to have you with us, and thank you very much for making yourself available this morning. I also would like to uh, to extend my gratitude to Professor Matheus Cardoso, which is who is here with us. Well, uh, he's a professor here at, at our university, teaches courses in graduate and undergraduate courses in uh, biomedical engineering, also with the research in AI to in the medicine field and uh, he has also experience in um, with startups and uh, entrepreneur is also an inter entrepreneur right uh, Mateo so I'm looking forward right. for you to, to engage uh, thank you Mateo for your av availability as well so okay let's move straight to Dr. Vincent presentation just want to make two uh, quick uh, reminders so following Dr. Vincent presentation we will we will open up to questions from our students and participants of the workshop who who are currently watching the seminar live from the university. Uh, as I was telling you before, we are both here with you in this virtual room, but the, um, uh, we are also projecting our talk in, in one of our physical rooms at the technology park at our, of our university. So for those in the audience, please feel free to prepare your questions uh, in English or Portuguese or even Spanish, right? <laughs> and, and we can, um, Okay. Uh, I think you, you, you and the others will interact with Karina, the professor who is there overseeing the, the session, and we will do. She will put the questions in the chat for us, and we will do our best here to translate them on the fly if needed. Okay. So, also um, a reminder: this session, along with others of the fifth edition of the workshop, uh, will be available on the Web's YouTube channel after the event for anyone who. Who may have missed it. Okay, so Dr. Vincent, thank you once more, and uh, the floor is yours. Be my guest. Thank you very, very much for, for having me. It's such a great honor, and well, meeting you all, even if it's online, I'm looking forward to, to meeting you all in, in person in the future. Okay, and thank you for, for the introductions, and let's get started. Okay, so, well, Professor Adenauer gave a good overview of, of me, but uh, I will give you a, a shorter overview or a short overview of my research. So, as he said, I, I have masters in uh, applied maths. That's why I have uh, Professor Andrew Wiles here in uh, in my presentation. I I take him everywhere I can because what he did with uh, Fermat's last theorem is just remarkable. And well, not in vain, I had some elliptic functions in, in my PhD too, so I thought it was it was good to have him here. The second guy, the drawing, I'm, I'm sure you haven't met him because he's a, he's a Catalan guy. Well, he was a Catalan guy in the 18th century, well, 19th century. And uh, well, he was the inventor of the, the telegraph as, as we know it. He was doing extensive experiments in sending uh, electric currents through, through cables conveying messages. So when people think about uh, the telegraph, they, we think about uh, 
Morse, but Morse was the guy who built the code. Very remarkable, but not the physical means. So that's why I also make apology of, uh, apology of, of, of this of these two people here. So my my research as an old chap as I am spans two centuries now, and uh, in the late uh, part of uh, of the last century, I. I got acquainted with artificial neural networks applied to digital signal processing uh, for uh, biomedical applications at, at the KTH at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm. I, I have uh, one of my degrees is coming from, uh, from this university. Then during my, my career, I, I started as a, as a consultant. And uh, luckily enough, I got bored of consulting and but I, I, I took two good lessons out of this. One was being able to formalize poorly defined problems, which is the leitmotif of consulting. And the second one, I, I got the, the love, uh, or I fell in love with, uh, with artificial intelligence. I started working in making forecast and predictive models for traffic analysis at uh, Accenture in, in France. I did projects across Europe. <coughs> and of course, uh, I, I got tired of, uh, of this uh, corporate life and I wanted to do something more uh, impactful in, in society. So I decided to pivot and wrap up all this knowledge for, for good in, in healthcare applications. So I started my, my PhD, which is in uh, in the about the management and the study of the pathophysiology of, of sepsis i will touch upon that in this in this lecture today and then finishing my my phd i i started um, working with artificial neural networks for uh, monitoring the cardiovascular function in particular making a predictive model from uh, cleft signals of uh, the actual values of, of blood pressure okay by that time, I'm speaking about the early 2000s, so let's say 2005, 2006. By that time, uh, deep learning was very, very early underground. Okay, uh, it was like five people working in, uh, in deep learning. And um, back in 2010, there's there was this uh, uh, paper from uh, Jeffrey Hinton, which took all the the academia by by storm where we were well, where he uh, proposed the contrastive divergence as a as the means for for training uh, restricted Boltzmann machines so I adapted that and it turned out turned out to be the one of the first patents in, uh, in deep learning applied to, uh, to to medical care or intensive care and I, it's one of the achievements that of which I'm most proud of then I carried on my research and started working in inflammatory diseases and uh, sepsis, cancer, and I started a couple of uh, startup, uh, startups. I, I also carried uh, different uh, projects in data mining. I became an Horizon 2020 reviewer and I, I'm the scientific director or coordinator, depending on who you call uh, at, at Eurecat. <laughs> so we, the reason we are called coordinators is because we have a scientific direction, but they are more related to publications and not the actual research. So the guys who are doing the research, we are the coordinators or coordinating the, the research activities of the units. So uh, my kind of uh, projects, uh, well, first, I Shocomics is from the, well, two war programs uh, ago. And this is where I happened to meet Federico at an NBC in, in Boston, and we decided to, well, go full blast and apply for uh, for this project. And amazingly enough, it got funded, and he got his uh, Marie Curie uh, Fellowship. And, uh, well, from there, and then our our friendship just grew, <laughs> OK? Other projects are the, the alternative, uh, which is currently ongoing. And it's about assessing uh, different pollutants and their impact on cardiovascular function, the MAPS cardia, which is about building scaffold models of uh, heart tissue, inducing uh, 
illness and contractility uh, illnesses or problems into this into these scaffolds and then we measure that and we make assessments through uh, first mathematical model modeling and then through uh, machine learning for translating this into the whole heart tissue and then modeling how we can revert that and experiment in both in vitro and in silico different different treatments. I have been co-chair for the Fed Open and uh, I haven't been reviewing projects for, for two years and I'm looking forward for, well, for the European Commission to call me back. Other projects uh, from the Spanish governments, uh, RETOS, uh, 2020, 21, 22, now 23, and, and so we go. So this should be me. And now the, the, the question is, uh, why are we here? And why are we talking about AI? And why are we talking about the singularity? Or why are we talking about uh, all these uh, work uh, places that are going to be uh, well dismantled or that will disappear because of the advent of uh, this AI revolution, right? So what I'm going to tell you is just my opinion. Everything is debatable, but I think it's uh, a good hypothesis, okay? The first uh, uh, tectonic force that has uh, brought about this, this revolution is, is more slow. More slow through which every two years the capacity of uh, transistors in a chip doubles and uh, the size uh, diminishes by half. And as you see, this uh, graph is in logarithmic scale and now with the advent of uh, GPUs, uh, we have been able to first process very, very large amounts of, of data in, uh, in reasonable time a typical training uh, for a model back in the day for my cardiovascular model, for example, could take about a week. Now it's just a matter of minutes. So you can really, uh, you can really see and feel if you are old enough how this uh, Moore's law is, is really pushing forward all these uh, all these activities in uh, in, uh, in high parallel computing. Okay, now we have infrastructure, so we can analyze a uh, uh, mm. very large amount of, math, of data, but where is this data coming from? What has been the, 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 the force or, or the driver for, for this humongous amount of data? And I recommend you this book from uh, Tom Friedman. It's, uh, it's rather old, but it's still valid in, in the way that the thesis of, of this book, spoiler alert, <laughs> is that uh, <coughs> back in the 90s, uh, with the revolution of the internet, uh, we wired with fiber optics all the globe. And this uh, generated the revolution of the internet, and with the internet came the data. And with this data came, or with these applications through the internet came all this data. For example, uh, the electronic health record, yeah, at least in Europe is coming from, from, from the 90s. Then uh, all the e-commerce uh, is coming from the 90s. Uh, all these huge repositories is coming from, from this uh, revolution of, of the internet. Of course, the, the bubble of the internet went bust. Uh, maybe the bubble of the AI will go bust. I foresee that it may happen, or at least it will stabi stabilize. But what I want you to take uh, as a message here is that through the internet and through all the applications that we built on that and through mobile applications, we have a very large uh, amount of data. This alone, with the, the disruption, and this is the, the thesis of this uh, book of the late uh, Clayton Christensen, he wrote uh, this book, which is The Innovator's Dilemma and the... <coughs> Innovators prescription, prescription, prescription. Sorry, and uh, with these two books, uh, what he's uh, advocating is the or presenting is the dynamics <coughs> of how different technologies that seem uh, very incipient and very mature start slowly but surely uh, moving uh, apart the incumbents, which normally are very very big companies and very, very big technologies, 
and and become the, the condensed themselves. And this is basically due to three different factors. One is convenience, one, the other one is quality, and the other one is momentum. And this can only be done, so says uh, Professor Christensen, through uh, small companies who are capable of pivoting. For example, today, nobody thinks about Kodak as a film company, or Fujifilm, or we mm, don't hear anymore about the iPod because it has been uh, cannibalized by, by the iPhone, and nobody is using uh, CDs because we are streaming to Spotify, and the list goes on and on and on. And I think I could start, I, I could give you a, an hour of, of examples, but I don't think it's, it's the point here. <coughs> then, how large? This is a, a result of a, of a poll that uh, was conducted some time ago, I think it's about 10 years old, and uh, they asked different data scientists and researchers how big uh, was their, uh, or what was the biggest data set they, they were analyzed. And here you see that uh, the terabyte and the gigabyte is, is more or less the common sense, or the, the, or the average, or the median of, of this uh, nice Gaussian that we have on, on the right. And this clearly shows the, the amount of, of data that, that we are currently analyzing. I have, uh, I did this, uh, this study back in uh, 2021, I think. It was after the pandemic, now it's bigger. But it gives you an idea of how uh, the amount of data evolved for me over time. So my first project at KTH was with the DARPA team database. It was a, a data set of uh, voice recording, 50 kilobytes, <laughs> very modest. Then the full traffic of the Carrefour Global Network. So the moment you buy a toothbrush in Brazil, uh, within three milliseconds, they know in Paris. It's a French company, not in vain, they want to centralize everything. So this, the, their traffic, on average, is about uh, 50, 50 megabytes on a normal uh, week. The uh, traffic for the Ministry of Economy in, uh, here in, uh, in Spain for the full year was 100 megabytes. And Basically, this, uh, <laughs> this traffic is coming from, uh, from the lottery, people accessing their website to see if they have become millions or not. My blood pressure data uh, was about 300 uh, megabytes, not bad. But then the smart ECG uh, was about 400 megs, and in uh, 2018, the health, the health forecast project, which was the generalization of, of the sociocomic projects, was, uh, project was about one terabyte. And then uh, the long cancer screening data, it's 500 gigabytes, now it's uh, two terabytes. So I put this in this graph on, uh, on the bottom right, and you see in logarithmic how <laughs> the, the different uh, data sets evolved over, over time. Quite, quite amazing. Of course, uh, well, there are some fun facts. Uh, Google processes over 20 petabytes of, of data every day. Uh, in 2007, only uh, YouTube generated 27 petabytes of traffic. I think they are now in the uh, in the area of uh, zettabytes. The LHC uh, produces about 20 petabytes of, u of usable data per year. It takes them a long time to analyze all this data and see how uh, the different particles interact with each other. The <coughs> the, the annual traffic, I couldn't find more, uh, more recent statistics, but I, I promise I, I will update this. It was about 8,000 petabytes in, in 2011. Mm. And well, in the next uh, decade, we well, they expect, uh, or within this decade, about 10 petabytes of data every hour by the SK telescope. So this gives you an idea of, uh, mm. of the amount of data that we have. And it, uh, then regarding the, the application, uh, we can go from the realm of uh, the micro, uh, scale, say, cell level, even uh, protein level, we can see how different drugs dock to different proteins. Uh, then we can also 
design new new molecules that will dock to different proteins to revert, for example, poisonings to revert inflammation, so on and so on. <coughs> and in this uh, in this realm, uh, yeah, bioinformatics is, is is the king, right? Because you need to interpret what proteins are associated to what pathway and this pathway to what system and then you can actually have a, an impact into this uh, metabolic or this pathway so that you can uh, revert uh, illness. Also, uh, now with the advent of, of CRISPR, we can even edit uh, genetic codes and, and print RNAs. So if you look at what happened within, uh, well, in the during the COVID pandemic that uh, we managed as a society uh, to develop uh, an mRNA vaccine in, in record time. It's, it's mainly due to to, the, to all these these efforts, right? Uh, seeing what was the virus causing the illness, seeing the targets, seeing the, the proteins, then back translating these proteins into a sequence of mRNA, then assessing if this uh, mRNA can induce immunity, testing it, and then, uh, well, <coughs> generating the, the herd uh, immunity. So you see how we have gone from the micro level, protein level, to the community, right? Of course, there are uh, different applications in uh, cancer treatment, cytology, histology, uh, medical imaging is, is very, very big. I will I will show you a, a project that I am currently working on at, at Eureka in this in this uh, in this topic. Then. Also, uh, out of hospital care becoming more and more important. It's a uh, it's a trend. When uh, uh, they asked one of my colleagues, well, "How would be the the hospital of the future?" He said, "It's going to be emptier because we are going to be managing patients uh, through out of hospital care and home care, and of course, life lifestyle factors. We can factor in, and this is where it goes into the personalized. I first talked about." Um, Precision medicine. Now we can talk about personalized, taking the person as a whole into the into the equation, and we are not only a system of organs and uh, and chemistry working in in sync. We we are also what we do and how we relate to each other, how we eat, the, the amount of sport that we do, and so on and so on. So you can also have an impact into that, and this uh, has an impact in your in your life too, and you. If you want to be holistic, you really have to take into consideration all these uh, all these factors if you want to protect from disease and, and prevent it. Right? Here, I want to show you a, a pipeline for for data processing. It's a plain vanilla pipeline. It could be used for almost anything. So typically, what you do is you you get to your data source, you connect to them remotely, normally through an API, for example. You can go to Ensemble and download, <coughs> <coughs> sorry for that, and download all the genes that may be related to a, to a certain illness. Say, I want to have all the HER2 uh, genes for, uh, uh, for breast cancer, OK? Then you, you connect this to a raw data bucket, so you store it in your premises. And then from there, what you have to do is a very important process, which is the data curation. Okay, so you first add some layer of logic, normally an ontology or schema. So okay, this is belonging to such and such genes. Such and such genes are, ge are, are generating such and such proteins, which are in my data set. So on, so on. And, and this logic is what is going to be driving your your model in the future. Of course, you have to to do the, the data cleanup. Okay, so you have to see the data ranges, how it is encoded, if uh, the data is is good, and if, or if you have missing values. Okay, and you, you need to address this normally through imputation or censoring and, and so on. And once all of that is is, is completed, then you will have the clean data bucket that is going to be ready for uh, your AI applications or your your models to, to get started and to, to be trained and, uh, and find you. So here you have uh, your uh, your different 
models or the different uh, things that you can do with this data. So you have your data sources, uh, you have uh, mm. here you ingest, here you have the harmonized with the pipeline that I just shown you. Normally you put a proxy here so that you can secure your, your data access. This is very important if you work with data hospitals or, or in a federated learning. And then you prepare the data, you extract some knowledge, you do some associations, and then you can build, for example, in this case, we do a, a deep reinforcement learning from, from this data. So this would be a typical, a deep, typical pipeline. However, but I have been talking about the AI pipelines, but what is really uh, AI? Okay, uh, I couldn't find a, a good definition, and I'm. I'm a big fan of definitions and the one of building models that can uh, act, that can think like a human, I think it's really, really lame and I don't like it. Or the other definition of building models that can mimic the function of the brain in your dreams. <coughs> so the best uh, definition that I could find is, com is coming from the philosophy uh, dictionary at, at Stanford University and they don't provide one definition they provide they, they provide four <laughs> and these four definitions are based on two dimensions one is replicating human capabilities or an idea of rationality and also based on their uh, how they act if they reason or they behave. They are different things. Okay, so in one of these definitions, uh, we would like to build systems that think like humans, or systems that think rationally, or systems that act like humans, or systems that act rationally. And there's a distinction between these these four. And also, there are some uh, nuances and, and problems, because. If we reason yeah, like, like humans, we know that, uh, well, sometimes we as humans are not as, as reasonable as we should be, right? We can uh, be based on behavior. Sometimes humans, uh, more than often, we, we do stupid things, right? So, okay, let's go to the stronger part of AI. Rationality, this platonic view of the rational being, yeah, but you can end up with systems that it's, impor it's impossible to interact with because they are so concerned about self-preservation that they don't let you uh, interact unless you are super logic as they are. And we humans uh, like uh, or, or are configured to manage uncertainty, right? So this, this would be a, a problem. And also systems that are rationally, well, Skynet, uh, we have uh, competition and uh, we have to, well, uh, <clears throat> annihilate all human race mm, not nice right of course i'm uh, i know i'm i'm being provocative and but at least i i, I want you to th think about how good but also about the dark side of all these applications because there's always a dark side on, on ai okay <coughs> now that we that we know what's artificial intelligence so like uh, systems that have the ability or the ability to reason or act or like humans or uh, rationally. Then we have machine learnings, which are the algorithms with uh, which enable this, uh, this reasoning or this, uh, this action. And then deep learning, which is a subset of, of the machine learnings through which we work with uh, artificial neural networks uh, with more than, than one layer, okay? Here you have a, a small uh, overview of the different uh, models that, uh, that you have. Of course, there are many more, but I think that with this, I could, could cover almost or as much as 90% of, um, of uh, all the models and algorithms that are out there. <coughs> there are models which are supervised. And by supervised, I'm talking about discriminative um, uh, machine learning, so not talking about generative uh, yet. So these supervised are mainly uh, 
designed to do two things. One is predict something or classify something. If you want to predict something, that it's a continuous variable or discrete, or that purpose is the same, we are talking about regression problems. So you say we have algorithms that are, which are like simple linear regression, the multiple linear regression, then you have uh, regularized models like the lasso and the rich, they, they do a pretty good job by mm. doing a non-line parameter selection and taking those which are more predictive of, of your outcome. You can also do polynomial regression and uh, also wavelets and, and so on. There are uh, also uh, mm. the other models which are classification saying, okay, we have um, a person and we want to know if uh, they have this cancer. Okay, this is a typical classification problem. So in this regard, we have the logistic regression, the k nearest networks, the support vector machine, or the support vector classifier, depending on how you want to call it. If you have uh, feelings for, for the Bayes theorem or your Bayesian, you have the naive Bayes or the, or the different Bayes networks. Of course, all these models accept uh, ensemble methods, which are the extreme gradient boosting, the cut boosting, the decision tree. Decision tree is not an ensemble method, but I, I don't know why I put it there. But since you are mixing different different variables to the prediction through the conditions, I thought it fits well here. Then you have uh, the random forest, and of course, deep learning with all this, uh, its arsenal of artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and so on. Of course, the transformers and the tension have opened the, the, the space for going beyond discriminative models. And now we have the, the generative models, where you basically create a representation of your data, and then Based on this representation, you can dialogue with your data and generate new data. And this was actually the advent of, of ChatGPT. They did an embedding of all the knowledge that uh, it's out there in uh, in the internet, and that's why now uh, they have problems with uh, copyright. But they did this embedding, and now what ChatGPT is when you have a question, it embeds it and it gives you the answer based on a similarity measure from these embeddings. So this is what makes you think or lets you uh, interact with, uh, with the model. Then you have the unsupervised models, or you can have clustering. Uh, for example, you don't know how your data is structured, right? So through clustering, you can see how data aggregates. And, uh, and then you can actually start making inference on that. OK, does it belong to this cluster, to this other cluster? And it's pretty useful in uh, when you're dealing with personalization or with human behavior or with uh, sociological applications. You also have the hierarchical clustering, the <coughs> Gaussian mixture models, and so on. There are other models like um, the PCA or the factor analysis for uh, reducing your dimensionality. Uh, sometimes, uh, more often than, than not, one then ends up with a data set with more variables than samples. And this is a problem, because it means that you could fit almost anything to your data, right? So here is where uh, where dimensionality re reduction comes uh, becomes handy, OK? And here you have PCA, factor analysis, the kernel PCA, the LDA, and so on. Here you can also use variational, variational autoencoders, uh, GANs, and so on. And then finally, we have the systems that learn by reinforcement. Uh, everybody knows what reinforcement is. We, it's how we train our, our dogs or, for example, by giving them uh, a prize every time they do something good, okay? Uh, or penalizing when they do something wrong, right? I recommend you do that with your dogs, okay? <laughs> and uh, so you always have to give prizes. So with this reinforcement, what uh, what you do is you have your, your rules, your data, you create a policy, and you optimize this policy to maximize an outcome. And it's, it's how you work. Mm. But deep down of all these models, there's always something which is the, the cost function. It's something that you aim to optimize so that 
your system performs well and generalizes uh, well. And this uh, cost function or loss function always depends on the input data and the different model parameters that you have, OK? Of course, if we are lucky, uh, our cost function will be convex, and there won't be any need for any kind of machine learning model, because you can always optimize it. And here you have different flavors, like the old simpler, simplex, which works very, very well for linear programming problems, the quadratic programs, and, and so on. But reality is super tough, and uh, almost no <laughs> uh, cost functions are, are convex. And this is a problem, because this means that sometimes you have to ho hope for the best, that you will at, less, at least get to a relative minimum. And I will show you the, that in a, in a second. Here you have a typical convex problem, boom, three iterations by gradient distance. You always, always, always will end up in your minimum. But what if your uh, function looks like that? This is a problem, because you can end up in a local minimum or a global minimum if you're lucky. And with dimensionality, this becomes more and more problematic. This is a, an issue. Now, <clears throat> why has uh, deep learning uh, taken the community and the applications by, by storm? Here, in the top line, this is coming from the book that I was mentioning before, uh, Clayton Christensen. Uh, here we have the old models that I have shown you two slides ago. And here we should have, for example, the support vector machine. It was big back in the day. But here, there were these three guys, uh, Jan LeCun, Joshua Benjo, and Jeffrey Hinton, working on, uh, on deep learning. By the way, uh, the models from deep learning are really old. They were called harmoniums, and they date from the 1950s. The problem was that uh, they couldn't be trained because they didn't have the data, or uh, well, nor the the, the methods to, uh, to to train that properly. So, oops, sorry. Uh, so here, what happened is they started working into training these models. Data became more available, and of course the the, the performance demanded for uh, recommender systems, for new, uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, for, I would say, for, for content aggregators, uh, for uh, content distribution, the imaging, uh, the multimedia, they needed more performance than the performance that the actual incumbents of SVM was doing, was giving them. So they started picking up and their growth was so high that nowadays, if you are not using a, a neural network with 50 layers, drop out and bytes normalization, you are no one. And this is because of this disruption in uh, in, in this market by, by deep learning. <laughs> but then why is it is it working? And it's a, a very valid question. And not many people know that. That's why I will impose this uh, this slide on, on you guys. Um, very recently, uh, half uh, the theorems of universal approximators, well, of uh, neural networks being universal approximators have been uh, proven. And the first result was that any uh, neural network with an arbitrary width can approximate any any function. Let's take this uh, third degree polynomial that I have in uh, in my slide. Okay. If I ask you, can I approximate this polynomial function with a regularized linear unit? Most of you will say no, <coughs> but I tell you yes. Here, if we take these three relus we see that we do a pretty good job of approximating the lower part of this uh, of this polynomial function. If I take this 6, you see that uh, we are doing a pretty good job of approximating the whole function. And by adding more and more regularized linear union, uh, units, sorry, 
I can make an approximation as root as as I want up to a narrow term epsilon, which is here that I'm showing with my with my mouse. So you see that this is a really really important and uh, and strong result. But let's go to the arbitrary idea, okay? <coughs> I like to think of it of it as a Fourier transform, but let's do it with, uh, with polynomials. It, it will be the same. Imagine that I want to approximate this uh, this uh, sinus function here. I can start with a line. I'm not doing a very good job, am I? Then I add a quadratic. Mm. Then I add a cubic, and I keep on adding more and more terms. Sorry, pop up. And the same happens. So by adding more complexity, I can also approximate any kind of function. And of course, this is how uh, different uh, deep learning models work. You have this uh, phase here. You have the low level features, which are mainly changes in color, gradients, and very basic structures. Then you have the mid-level features, which is like an eye, a nose, and hair, mouth. And then the high-level features are really, really spooky because these are actually representations of the weights of this uh, unit that was used to, <coughs> to actually predict faces, right? And you see how the network starts building this representation. I would not say knowledge, but you see that by adding more layers, you approximate better and better what you want to predict, right? OK, so with, uh, with that in mind, uh, let's uh, get started with one of the applications that, uh, that we have been working. Okay, so in uh, show comics and in health forecast, what we wanted to do is uh, for show comics predict through proteomics at different levels. Uh, it was mainly proteomics, metabolomics, and uh, no, it was proteomics, transcriptomics, and then in health forecast, it was metabolomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. Uh, we wanted to predict new biomarkers that allow uh, an early diagnosis. For health forecast, it was uh, sepsis in general. For shockomics, it was uh, shock and cardiogenic shock. But in this case, what we wanted to do is find uh, new biomarkers that will allow uh, an early diagnosis of, of sepsis and predict its occlusion. Also, since uh, there has been a, a shift in the definition of, of sepsis, uh, we wanted to see if uh, <coughs> there was a physiopathologic difference between the systemic inflammatory response and, and sepsis. And if this was the case, we also wanted to assess how organ dysfunction and, uh, and mortality were, were driven through a, or were portrayed through a, the circulating plasma proteins. So in order to, to do that, we did a prospective observational single center study. It was carried uh, at uh, Hospital Vallebron with, uh, with their ICU uh, doctors, which is a, a tertiary hospital in, uh, here in Barcelona. Patients were all uh, over 18, 18 years, years old. We took... Uh, plasma samples and uh, they well they normally do that at this uh, hospital and they have a huge biobank so we took uh, all the patients who were compliant with, uh, with the inclusion criteria and this plasma was analyzed through mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry. then we did a recursive uh, feature elimination classification so first we did some statistical analysis then we did some uh, feature elimination because of course we ended up with more proteins than patients and then we use the all plane logistic regression and support vector machine why is that uh, because first of all we have tabular data and these two models work well with, with tabular data second of all 
because we are more interested in seeing the mechanisms and not uh, making the actual predictions, even though I will impose on you some results. But this was a knowledge discovery uh, study, so we really wanted to know which proteins could be considered as more protective or more deleterious, okay? So then we could use them for stratifying and for classifying this uh, sear sepsis classification and organ dysfunction. And also we wanted to know what was more dysregulated uh, in, in the mortality in the assessment, okay? So, uh, what are we talking about? The consensus definition of 1991, we had uh, systemic inflammatory response. So if you have an infection and if you have the two, then you say that uh, we have sepsis. <coughs> of course, the drivers of uh, of the systemic inflammatory response could be trauma, aspiration, and so on and so on. But also, uh, sepsis is also a stage. You can have a plain sepsis, so you have some uh, infection and sears, you have the severe sepsis, organ dysfunction uh, uh, stands raising, and then if you have a septic shock, then you have a, a dysregulated response to a uh, to pressure administration and then you really have trouble in, in keeping uh, blood pressure uh, at bay for, for this patient, right? Now, uh, in 2016, uh, a new um, definition came along and uh, it was defined as uh, life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. However, uh, this organ dysfunction is currently measured by the sequential organ failure assessment score. And if you have a SOFA score of greater than two, then you have this, uh, you fulfill this uh, sepsis criteria. However, when it comes uh, to management, then you really have a problem. And that problem is that you are lagging behind the infection and you better start the bundles very, very rapidly, which are the only treatment that has been proven to work. But hey, you have absolutely no clue of what is driving this uh, organ dysfunction and this dysregulated response. And this is what we wanted to do with, with this project. So, what are the driving hypotheses or the research questions that we wanted to, to answer. First, uh, is there a difference between uh, the systemic inflammatory response and sepsis at the programmatic level? So, in other, in other words, is it okay to have moved from the old definition to the new one? The second question is, are there circulating plasma proteins that are associated with organ dysfunction? In other words, is there anything that we could start looking at that will be driving this organ dysfunction so that we can take action uh, before it's too late? And finally, uh, the same question, but applied to mortality, because even uh, if mortality is a definite state, okay, you cannot resuscitate normally, <coughs> it can be very, very tricky because one of the take home messages from uh, past research is that we were sometimes uh, or always very much uh, concerned about predicting mortality in the ICU, but this uh, well, has been proven to be flawed because most of the patients who have uh, survived uh, a sepsis with major organ dysfunction uh, will die intra-hospital or within the next 100 days of, uh, of uh, having uh, the, the sepsis. So it's, it's really a problem because you can say, okay, I have this prediction of uh, with an accuracy of 80% of uh, ICU mortality, yes, but then it's gonna increase and be flawed uh, when you take uh, hospital mortality or mortality at 100 days. And this is really something that has been driving me crazy for, uh, for the last years and still does. 
because sometimes you don't see patterns between the three different mortalities, right? Despite being a, a very uh, definitive state. Oh. Now, uh, to the population description. Oh, it's been cut. What a pity. Anyway, we have uh, 141 patients with sepsis and 136 patients with uh, with uh, systemic inflammatory response, uh, age, uh, the leg goes like lactates, the PCR at uh, at uh, ICU admission, the plat the, um, the platelets, and, and so, and we only see that we had some differences in lactate and so on. Of course, because one population is septic and has more organ dysfunction, fats. Uh, they have to have a higher sofa and they have to have a higher lactate. Oh, we can discover the, the soup, but at least it's these uh, statistics are telling us that the results and the populations are similar. Okay, we are we have a good population for uh, studying what we want to study. Okay, this is the message from, from this slide. Here's the, the pipeline that we put uh, together. <clears throat> First, we we pass the plasma, or we process the, cell the plasma, we pass it through the mass spectrometer, and then from here we take a Kruskal Wallis H sets, separating the populations, first of uh, Sears versus sepsis, and we found out that we had 110 proteins that were statistically significant. For uh, organ dysfunction, we have uh, found 177 proteins related to organ dysfunction. Of course, this is still a lot of uh, proteins. So we did this backward feature selection. Of course, we know that there's a limitation of combinations, but hey, you have to make compromises sometimes in life, right? And um, through that, we ended up with 31 proteins for sepsis and then nine proteins only related to uh, organ dysfunction and 22 for mortality. Out of these proteins, we trained uh, through uh, tenfold cross-validation, a logistic regression model, and a support vector machine model. Of course, here we applied the OCAMS uh, razor. If you get good results with a simple model, just keep it. So that's why we have logistic regression for the first case. And that's why we have an SVC uh, for, uh, for the second study. Now, uh, <coughs> with the logistic regression, we have been capable with uh, this set of proteins to predict whether the patient was uh, septic or uh, Sears with an accuracy of 97%. This means that uh, we only had three errors out of 100 patients with a sensitivity of 99% and a specificity of 94%, yeah. which is quite cool in a way because I have never seen a, a logistic regression perform that well. Also, we see that all the proteins that are related uh, to uh, to this uh, Sears sepsis study are driving the patient towards the septic uh, state. And here we we wanted to know, oh, but what are the mechanisms? Who are the culprits? So what we did is we put this list of proteins into the string software. If you don't know it, I recommend you you have a look because it's it's worth it seeing it working. And we came up with uh, with this um, graphical model. And not only did we see the association between the different proteins, but also we we assessed the function or pathway assessed. Uh, uh, yeah, the pathway associated to this uh, to this protein. So uh, we see that some are related to opsonization, which is the response to infection. Hey, bingo! But um, it's uh, I, I have seen that very very seldom in uh, in in the literature. We have the cellular response to the lipoteicoic acid and the toll uh, like receptor four, which uh, is and has been a, a well known. Uh, 
signaling pathway for, for sepsis. The acute phase response, that's why we see the difference in uh, the statistics, and the complement activation. Uh, I presented these results at the, at the European Shock Society in, in Vienna this, uh, well, some weeks ago. And uh, Marcus Hoverland said, yeah, but we said that, yes, but you have a, po a population of polytraumatics. This is a general population. So we, we are showing the generalization of the model, right? Now let's go for organ dysfunction and mortality. And here we see that we have two proteins that are more or less uh, <clears throat> deleterious and some of them which are more, no, which are protective and the other uh, uh, seven are more deleterious. And here we see that for organ dysfunction, we have an accuracy lower than the other classifier with an accuracy of 82%. And here I want you to have a look at the specificity value, which is 84%. And also for mortality, the specificity value is 72%. If we take the SOFA score and as such, and we build uh, or we want to assess mortality, and normally we know that SOFA scores are higher than seven, seven are associated with higher mortality, this classifier has uh, a specificity lower than 50%. <coughs> and, and this is a, a problem. And we see that we are outperforming already the, the, the use of, of the SOFA scale, at least for mortality. And then regarding organ dysfunction, of course, we have taken the SOFA score so, score, so I can tell you about the specificity of this of the score itself, but taking it as a reference, and only with the with the proteins, we are capable of uh, very much mimicking the the behavior of organ dysfunction as measured by the SOFA score. score. So uh, what we are hypothesizing here is that we could enhance and enrich the SOFA scale with different biomarkers coming from here through further research and validation, of course, so that we could get a timely or better uh, indication of the evolution of this, of this patient over time and towards a better or worse uh, trajectory or pathway through, through their illness, right? Now going to, uh, <clears throat> to the results of organ dysfunction. We also did the same, we went into, into string and for organ dysfunction, we saw that uh, two act in the complement. Once again, Marcus was very happy. Two were related to the lipoprotein metabolism. Quite cool because we have been hearing that for a, for a long time. And at least this is the first time that they have seen it black over white in one of our experiments. Also related to the inflammatory response, of course, it's an inflammatory syndrome. The regulation of proteolysis, I was super happy to, to see this, uh, this result because it confirms what we already saw, show, saw with, uh, with Federico in, in Chocomin. And the innate immune response, so again, something related to, uh, to opsonization. Regarding uh, mortality, uh, we had proteolysis becomes more and more important. We see it's driving uh, organ dysfunction and eventually it's driving the final outcome in the ICU. The inflammatory response, of course. <coughs> Immune response, lipid transport and complement activation. So we see that the culprits are the same more or less throughout the whole process. Remember when I was talking about the continuum? And we see that they become more and more apparent, uh, apparent the sicker the patient gets, which is uh, very, very interesting for also assessing uh, patient trajectories. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, we, uh, we offer insights in, into the biological processes uh, underlying sears and sepsis. We see the mechanisms I have, as, as, as I have uh, explained a minute ago. We see that these uh, different mechanisms and pathways become more and more activated and important as the, as the illness progresses. And of course, this makes us hypothesize uh, 
that some of these uh, proteins may become or may be considered as biomarkers for the evolution of, of sepsis and, uh, and mortality. So this is what I wanted to, to show you for, uh, for this first uh, study, and I will go into the, into the next presentation in, in a minute, I will switch. Here you have the, um, in this QR code, you have the, the link to the, to the actual uh, article. Uh, the second one about uh, Sears and sepsis is, is being uh, edited as, as we speak and reviewed, and hopefully it should be published very, very soon. Okay, so thank you for, for that, and I will move into the next presentation. I don't know if you want to, to do some um, questions now or, or not. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, we have uh, probably a lot of questions, and uh, I don't know how Okay, so let's, let's do them at the, at the end. Okay. Karina, what do you think there? Can we expand a little bit also, also on, uh, on time for the next session? We can expand a little bit more, or maybe we could see first the, 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 the different... I, I think I can do this in 30 minutes, more or less. 30 to 40, okay. so we will have about uh, half an hour for, for questions. If you want, I can speed up. Okay, I th I guess that we you know, our next presentation just to confirm with those that are in the room is at uh, ten ten and a half or ten o'clock, just to, just to confirm. Listen. Ten. Oh, okay. So uh, we have half an hour in total. Listen, uh, before the. Oh next, my God. Uh, okay, so uh, I will speed up for uh, that. Sorry for that. <laughs> sorry for that. No worries, no worries, no worries. I can do that, been there, done that. Okay, I just wanted to show you uh, what we are doing in computer vision for, for deep learning for the sake of uh, transparency and also for opening that debate. I will skim through it and and then we, we open up the debate, okay? This is the, the team that participated in the, um, in the project and uh, what we wanted to do is classify uh, Bloom nodules to CT scans and uh, X-rays, <coughs> so that we could do a proper screening uh, of, uh, of lung cancer. What it's the take-home message from uh, this presentation is twofold. Not a big deal. First, we wanted to develop a model AI-based that could work like uh, a radiologist does. So if you look at the literature, you will see that most of the articles, what they do is they uh, analyze the CT and then they tell you whether it's cancer or not. No, I was about to say a bad word. No, it isn't. The way that the radiologist works is they take a CT scan, they look for the nodules, they take a second CT scan, they look for the nodules again, and they see if they grow and, or they don't. And this is how they work. And this is how our system will work. Then going to the to the to the x-rays something that it's uh, very much uh, or causing a lot of debate here in europe is oh but you are being unfair because you are only uh, putting into cancer screening problem programs people who are at risk what happens to the 20 percent of people who have a lung cancer who have never been in risk for example never smoked and we said okay we hear you and how can we do that? Uh, all of us uh, regularly have, or more or less regularly, have uh, X-rays. So if we have find an anomaly in an X-ray, then we can put into the screening program. So at least we are not covering the 20% of people who are not being covered, but at least we are creating a safety net, safety net to uh, take as, as many people as we can into the system. So, uh, we wanted to do more accurate diagnosis, personalized descriptions, get this word out, and so on. What I want to show you is uh, we have a longitudinal cohort, we are working with different uh, data sets. This is from a clinical study that we did at Hospital Valle Brun 2. We have, uh, well, quite a few uh, publications, two PhD theses, and uh, 
it's been a project that has been going on for a long time. We can also do a detection. You see here how we identify the mass, how we segment it, and then from it, at two different time points, we are capable of assessing the malignancy. Also, if you look into the attention of the network, what are the most uh, apparent features? You see that the core and kernel of the nodule is more highlighted. So this is clearly a, an example of the, of the system uh, learning and performing well. Then the problem of identification it's really non-trivial because, uh, well, it's deformed. You see that this CT scan is not the same as this one. And this nodule is the nodule here, but actually doing the pinpointing, it's really, really tricky. So we spend uh, well, a lot of time doing that and trying to find that, well, finding the biggest nodule because it's the one, or the one that changes the most because it's what we want to show to the radiologist eventually. We have a, a demo and uh, it's, uh, it's now currently being, well, it's in progress and we need to, we are going to integrate into hospitals here in Spain and also one in Italy by Federico, Emilia Romagna, I don't know if you are friends with Santa Ursula. And now I would like to show you a bit the pipeline. So we have the detection at different time points, we segment, we quantify, we assess the malignancy and the progression. Then regarding the RX, uh, what we did is we created uh, a system that is grabbing all the X-rays from uh, from the hospital. Of course, we need to classify. If first we were naive and we were taking the, <coughs> the images as were, and of course we and and we were looking into the dicom saying frontal X-ray. Oh, naive because we found. Feet, we found abdomen, everything, and also you you would be amazed of the different things that you can find in the chest of people. I wouldn't say that. So we first did one classifier for separating the frontal part of the thorax, and second classifier check for nodule or anomaly. Here uh, we did uh, a study. Here you have the numbers, but. What I want you to know is, is this one. And it's that uh, on average, in a retrospective study, we could find one lost case of cancer every month in a major hospital in, in Barcelona. This related to, <coughs> to the whole region of Catalonia is about 244 cases per year that are lost. And what's even more creepy is that uh, these cases could have taken who could have been detected on average four years before the onset of symptoms. Which means that uh, if we had this tool in place, we would we could have saved some of these people, or at least got them to treatment much, much earlier. And with that, I think I will I will leave it here and open up the, the discussion for, well, the floor for discussion because I think it will be so unfair for me to do all the talking. Thank you, Vincent. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm having just a moment. There is a next. Okay. Thank you. And um, we have a lot of uh, uh, questions that we received from my image from all of, from all of them. Uh, maybe uh, I will leave some of these questions for the tomorrow session that the Professor, Professor Rivas will be with us again, right, uh, yeah. Professor, with in yeah. the round table. And, and we will be able to discuss maybe more at length some of the, the questions that are coming up. Um, I, uh, it was an outstanding uh, presentation. I'm certain that our students that are watching this now understand the great privilege for all of us who have uh, who had the opportunity to hear your lecture. Yesterday, we had uh, another lecture from Professor Paulo Lisboa, who teaches us on yes. the best practice of artificial intelligence in medicine. And now in your lecture, it, it just got perfect follow-up. We had not only an overview of the methods, but some of the uh, how some of these are being seen right now. Uh, uh, some of these methods are being seen right now in the courses for our students are studying uh, some of the methods that you mentioned. So it was just perfect for that. And also, um, yeah, your example with the, yeah, exactly. And uh, your example with the, with the sepsis research was uh, what it was what Professor Lisboa was talking yesterday in action when you're using AI also to 
to understand the mechanism and not only to do prediction. And so this is this is also uh, really great. So thank you so much for that. I I will so open the floor for questions. Um, the students are already sending the, the questions, but I think I, I will. Sorry. So how to consciously use machine learning and AI for students? Good question. You have to know better than the model. And I use uh, ChatGPT myself. I love using it for programming and solving uh, some problems. But what I can tell you is when you ask it for very deductive stuff, don't pay attention to it because it deliberates. Yeah. It just accelerates. It's delusional. It's like having something on drugs. So you have to know. You have to know what you're looking for, and you have to do the work yourself, and also question first yourself and what the algorithm is telling you. And not only with AI, in life in general, it's, it's good prophylaxis for uh, mental health. So uh, yes, use it, go ahead, uh, it's helpful, it's powerful, but guys, you have to know better because you are the ones steering the wheel. Uh, AI systems are stupid and they don't reason, okay? Know that. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so uh, this, just uh, before uh, addressing the other question, maybe Matheus would like to make some question here uh, for Dr. Yeah. Rivas. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank and congratulate your presentation. It was a real pedagogic and nice presentation for the students. And uh, one thing that I, I have many things not only to ask, but talk to you, so we'll do it later in other opportunity. But uh, sure. concerning the topic and mainly deep learning topic, one thing that bothers me a lot and a lot of researchers is the data complexi complexity. So if we take it strictly, uh, we will never do research on deep learning because we will the, the models, the deep learning models, as net, inception, and so on, they are pretty much complex. They have millions of parameters. And if we go strictly to the rules, we would have to have millions of data or images in the case of lung cancer and so on. What do you think about it? I, I, in, my, in my view, uh, we cannot stop researching even so we, we, are, we, we don't acquire enough data. But it, there is a concern about it. What do you think about this? Wow, you're, you're touching a, a very complex thing. And, and very relevant because we cannot stop research on deep learning. We have to make a do with whatever we have. I can only dream of having a huge data set of long nodules. If I have, let's say, 6,000 CT scans for training, I consider myself lucky. We have them and we have 200. And this is small data, or I would even call it no data for the models that we are training. Which takes me to the second point that you were that you were mentioning, which is we have huge models and we need to simplify that. And what really nags me is that almost nobody seems to care about the complexity. The bigger the better. No. Yeah. And and that's why I think that we have to make progress in pruning neural networks in seeing, for example, uh, now I'm working in some, in uh, trying to, and I think that I'm going to fail blatantly, an invertible CNN, so that this way I can see how the weights are adapting. If they are zero, then I can prune them, and then I can have control into the complexity of the model. Because nobody today can uh, interpret what the GPT model is doing. It has like, I don't know if it's 40 million parameters, I and mean, it's crazy. So. I would say, as I was saying before, stop down, relax a bit, be critical, and ask yourself, why is this working? And could I make a do with something simple? So, Mateus, you are right. We, we have to, to go down that path and yeah. keep going and not just generating more and more scripts or more complex models. Thank you very much. 
We seem to... That's right. Uh, and related to this, uh, that you have, uh, uh, how, what's your impression on these attention-based models? Uh, in the sense that um, this paper, I remember that a colleague of mine, I'm not in the AI field, but a colleague of mine in your cognitive neuroscience recommended me some time ago, like four years ago or something like that. This uh, attention is all you need paper from the Google yeah. team that introduced it. Those from they were talking. Oh, look! They are talking about attention now in artificial intelligence, which is a very important concept in cognitive neuroscience, of course. And and so, uh, uh, is it? Do you think it is actually a, a paradigm shift, as some argue? This attention-based model. Do you think that this will really go in the direction of being applied in medicine, as they some of these uh, these people argue, or there are these difficulties related to the amount of data and the of uh, how they are these models are opaque and we don't understand exactly what's happening there okay first the good news the good news is that it works well and it opens up uh, a vast amount of applications yeah. and it works very well okay now to the bad news uh, the bad news is that it's not attention as we know it and we are always giving crutches to AI because now I see you, Professor Adenauer, and I pay attention to you and to your question. If I were an embedding, I would have paid attention to anything of in front of me because it's what's in my embedding and then I would spit mm -hmm. out the class with the most similar probability to my knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So this is, of course it's working, but it's a crutch and it links to the to what we were discussing before we need to understand better the fundamentals and what are the drivers of reasoning and how we can model that mm -hmm. and start calling things by their name it's, it's i i will it's it's attention but it can be misleading because here we are we are educated people we are critical and we we work at this in, in some parts in, in ai and we know what we're talking about but you take my wife and I tell her about attention and she will think that the, the attention exactly. I'm talking about, it's her attention and it's not the case. Yeah. Great. So we have a question for a student. That, let me try to, to translate it here. Uh, yeah, if you have okay. already identified uh, potential biomarkers for sepsis and how are these? Yes, 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 yes. They are, they are potential. They, they need validation, Karina. Uh, well, not Karina, because she's the one who wrote the question, whoever yeah. it was. Uh, they are not yet biomarkers, they need more validation, but we have strong candidates, and I think mm -hmm. it's good. So we need validation, and hopefully more studies will come along, along from us or from other people who will confirm that. So, uh, Marcus was complaining he was the first. Okay, it's confirmatory, so let's start looking for the complement and start bragging about who was first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, next one. Do you think that machine learning and AI could also be used to detect autoimmune disease and sepsis uh, alongside, alongside using the protein detection that you have already mentioned why white blood by white blood cells and neuro, uh, neurotrophils? And if so, would the data be compared with the data of the general population or would it also be interesting to compare to overall measurements of the base quantity of the individual himself, considering the different physio physiology of people? Guys, you have here a candidate for a master's thesis. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes, indeed. Short, short answer to your long question. Yes, indeed. And also, uh, you have plenty of pathways and data sets to start looking at. I recommend you start looking at the ensemble, the embos, and so on. Look at the proteins for anti. Pick your autoimmune disease get your data and see what you find and maybe you will be surprised <laughs> so yeah give it a shot yes great um well i have other questions uh we have to have time so you recently published an article discussing this this uh, ai use in re relation to dial dialysis right uh Oh, yes. <laughs> could you, could you, uh, I saw that, just uh, it's curious for me, but could you provide us a little more, just the overview of the idea of integrating this type of technology into dialysis? Uh, I, how, how exactly would this work in general terms? No, you don't, don't need to go in detail. Okay, this... <laughs> wow, I'm, 
you, you caught me off guard here. Anyway, uh, it's about uh, the use of generative AI. And one problem with, uh, with hemodialysis is uh, basically uh, the balance of electrolytes, okay? Yeah. And it's a super complex problem. Okay. So, uh, here we hypothesize first, if you can uh, get the data from these analytes, which is really, really difficult because you are filtering the blood and then you can cause all this, uh, all this electrolyte imbalance, then you first can model this uh, this effect, and also you can use this very model to generate new data so that you can adapt a closed loop and start uh, monitoring these patients better. Which, of course, takes a new paradigm shift into the management, but also into the, well, into the prediction, but also into the management, because you can adapt online, yeah. because you are going to be like doing an adversarial example where you want your system to start failing. And you generate more data, and you start. Doing, so it's it's more or less what we are hypothesizing here with uh, with Alfredo and, um, and Professor Hueso. Oh, great! And, the, and the, for this, you are trying generative models. Yes, we are. Yes, okay, we are. Great. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this is the way to. There's no data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. May I ask one more? Yeah, sure. Let's okay, go. Uh, talking about generative models and image. Uh, related to image, to medical image, do you think we will reach a time that it will provide, talking again about about data, will provide uh, extra data, that relevant data to train, to improve our models, our classification models? Because so far, at least the, the ones that I saw, uh, they, they are quite often relevant so far, because the data, of course, they, they can, they, they construct information from the data that they have. Yeah. So. I I tell you, since we are here in family, I, I don't know how the people in the in the room are uh, <laughs> because it's it's like so cozy here and I know that there are like I don't know how many people <laughs> in the classroom. But anyway, I will be brutally honest with you. I'm very concerned because we got funded a, a project which is called Phase Four precisely for that, generating uh, image data with generative mode. And when I see the state of the art, I cringe, because if I have to generate a CT scan with all the complexity inside of the lab, with uh, the air, the tissue, the ribs, the spine, the heart, plus all the vessels, and then add a nodule there out of the blue, which can be solid, semi-solid, or whatever and i really don't know uh, i hope it, we will get some success if not as somebody else and we are definitely working on that if not i think we will be humble and if we can provide a proper data augmentation algorithm for training something then i would be the happiest man in the world now generating dynamic data as they claimed in the project I'm cringing. I don't know how we're going to justify that, but anyway, we'll try. <laughs> Let's keep working. Yeah. Let's get uh, uh, I have here uh, some of the questions from the audience uh, in my email. So one of these, uh, considering the dynamic nature of sepsis pathology and its complexity, how do you envision the long-term adaptability of the developed machine learning uh, models in accommodating potential variations in patient response and evolving clinical practices and ensuring their continued relevance and effectiveness all, all time. Yeah, um, there's, uh, I haven't done anything along these lines, but I have read very, very interesting pro uh, papers about applying deep reinforcement learning to the uh, management of the septic patient. Some people claim in their articles that uh, they outperformed the, the practice of, of the doctors. And it's reassuring in a way, not because I want to substitute the doctors, because, but because it's capable of capturing this dynamic nature of, of sepsis. So I think it's the way to go uh, by adding the dynamics. And I wish I have the time and, uh, and the effort <laughs> To, to, to get started with it because it's 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 uh, it's amazing what, what you can achieve if you add the dynamics of everything. And my question is, okay, why do we don't put in dynamics the 
proteins that we have seen and we'll build a probabilistic model and see how how things turn to it so yeah i have more questions than answers but dynamics is important cool and uh, worth uh, area of research of for exploration um perfect another one given the significant impact of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome in the diagnosis of sepsis and it's in the interdependence with organ dysfunction and icu outcomes could you elaborate on the potential implications of your findings for refining the current clinical definitions and criteria for sepsis uh, diagnosis and management and how this might influence future research directions in in clinical mm -hmm. critical care medicine yeah it boils down to the dynamics imagine i have this uh complement activation that is related to, to everything, right? It was one of the common denominators. Mm -hmm. Then if I have somebody that steps into my hospital and I see that they start with a fever, they start with, uh, with uh, a major infection because they have a pneumonia and so on. And then I start seeing that this uh, marker starts going on. Then I, if I put them on antibiotics or if I, yeah, major antibiotics, if I see that this is going down, I say, okay, maybe it's just a cold sepsis, it went well, nothing mm -hmm. happened. It starts going up, then I say, hey, uh, I may need pressors in the next three hours. So why don't I start taking a more conservative approach and seeing if I can preserve the cardiovascular function of this patient? And then you can start uh, building upon that. I'm not a doctor, as you have seen, I'm a mathematician engineer. So and this, I leave that to the doctors, but I think that the dynamics is important. And if you have the picture, then you can act uh, properly beyond this giving antibiotics or removing the source of infection within the first hours, right? So this is where every, all of that comes, becomes handy, I think. Yeah. Um, Matheus, do you have a, 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 a other questions? No? No, it's OK. Yeah, I probably okay. will, will talk to Vicente in other occasion. Um, okay. Yeah, Very nice talking. I'm I not, uh, between entrepreneurs, people. between researchers, entrepreneurs, we have a business to talk. And, yes, uh, business. And, yeah, <laughs> we have some business to talk in research and in real business. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if Adenauer is going to finish. And thank you, no, again, I, Vincent. Yeah, well, I, I just thank you. Well, maybe maybe Vincent could comment quickly, if you, if, if possible, on your experience there in this entrepreneur front in Spain, Vincent. Uh, we we are here yeah. are trying to do some things in, with startups. Matheus uh, is one of those people working on this. What's your in general impression of how AI will be uh, will, is being integrated in the startups and uh, regulations and all that, all that? From your experience this is another this is another conference <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Oof. and well i don't know if i should be politically correct in spain is more and more difficult because oh my god they are i don't know if it's the same in brazil but spain in general and europe was well, europe in particular in general and spain in particular they are more concerned about the 10 times uh turnout revenue for the, the, the VC is demanding, so they need impact rather than solid science and uh, societal uh, impact, which uh, is frustrating in a way. It's impossible to get funding now for sepsis in Europe. Oh, really? Uh, you know yes. So then we can talk about other options. There's also a bright side, but now I think you Call me in a negative part or, or, or a mood about the, the entrepreneurial uh, scope here in, uh, in Europe. Okay. But yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> the bad moment. It's, it's passion, I think, and interesting. Uh, great. Uh, well, uh, one final question. We are broadcasting okay. now to, to a room of future biomedic engineers, many young enthusiasts interested in the use of, of technology medicine. What message would you give to this new generation at such a pivotal moment in the development of this technology? If young Vincent were, were, were sitting here, what, what would you like to hear? I would like to hear dare to try, dare to fail, stay curious and love what you do. That's a great message. I think it's a, it's a great way to 
to end. So thank you again uh, very much, Vincent, for this. Thanks, you. Uh, uh, let's, uh, well, we'll be able to continue maybe and expand this discussion tomorrow in our, in our round table. Yeah. We'll, we will be joined by Professor Lisboa, by uh, Livia Chabati from the Albert Einstein Hospital here in Sao Paulo, and Professor Vincent uh, will also be there with us. So we're very much looking forward to this final session tomorrow. And thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you, everyone present. Thank you. Nice and see you. Well, see you all tomorrow. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. See you guys.